So our next and final talk of the evening is about Fuchsia, Google's mysterious new operating system that may or may not replace Android one day, nobody knows. Uh, David Lelick will be walking us through the steps he took to compile and run this exciting new platform and show a real Flutter app running on Fuchsia. So, really exciting. Uh, David has been obsessed with code since 1988. He has worked on teams of all sizes from his own studio to startups to Fortune 500 companies. In recent years, his focus on developer relations has taken him around the world where he speaks codes and writes about best practices in development. He is presently the CEO of devrelevers.io, a DevRel agency based in New York. So let's give a big, huge Flutter NYC welcome to David Lee So developer relations is kind of a new thing. You might have seen people that uh, work in DevRel at conferences, showing you how things work. Uh, I want to make it super clear that I do not work for Google. This is not a Google talk. I'm just a huge fan of new things. So even though I do developer relations for my business, this is not one of those moments. This is just me, a fan of new things, trying Fuchsia as a developer. So we decided to uh, poke around at Fuchsia, and I set a, a goal for myself. I wanted to see what it looks like to run Flutter in this environment. I wanted to see, is it ready? Why did I think of doing that? Well, they released a new website. Uh, have you guys seen Fuchsia.dev? So this website goes live, and then it disappears, and then it comes back, and it's like, oh, quick, do whatever it does. So I did. and. This will be that. I'm going to show you what it does, what you can do if you follow the steps that they've given you, plus ask for help at the very last minute to achieve the same results that you will see here tonight. So the steps to uh, enjoy this experience. Uh, step one, be a developer. Uh, this is not a talk for people who develop operating systems. I am not one of those people. I'm a developer. I've mainly focused over the years on web development, a little bit of systems programming, and you know, just basics in that regard. Mostly anything that happens on the web, that's, that's where I've been playing. So I don't know how to write a, a driver for a graphics card. People that do know how to do that are responsible for the success of any operating system, whether it's a mobile system or a desktop system, or as we'll see tonight, maybe a little of all of the above. So raise your hand if you're a developer of any kind. So that's good. That means you and I can relate on at least this one thing, and I think that these are the things that, that we probably have in common. I want to distinguish between a developer and a programmer. A programmer is someone who writes code. A developer does that, but they're aware of their surroundings. You know the context. You know where that code's going to live and what it needs to connect to and how to keep it running. We love to write code, read code, talk about code. Uh, we're aware of the context, and we when we share our experiences, everyone wins. And that's why meetups like the Flutter NYC meetup are so great because we come together and we share our experiences, and we can pass along information about how to tap into the underpinnings of the uh, mobile devices and how to play with audio. It, it blows my mind to see how accessible that is to uh, just type some code and you've got this power at your fingertips. So step one, what is Fuchsia? I don't know. So if you came here tonight hoping to ask this question and be like, okay, so what's the real deal here? What's, what's Fuchsia? I don't know what Fuchsia is. I know the pieces that they've put in my hands I got them to run, and I'll show you that, and it's, it's fascinating to see the things that they've wired up. But as a developer, I've got pretty much one thing in mind. Is this a place that I'm ready to run my code? I'm interested in their code, it's fascinating, but I'm mostly curious, is this a place that I'm ready to run my code? And I'll think about that out loud a little bit more. So, it's at least these things, it's new. Um, it's not based on Linux, it's open source, and I found it surprisingly approachable. You'd think for something that's got almost no marketing, like people have barely admitted to it until recently, and you know, we're not really getting like a, a sales pitch, like here's why you should use Fuchsia. 
it's it's mysterious because nobody's really turning up the volume and saying, hey, look at this thing over here. And I'm certainly not trying to do that to me. I'm not trying to say, hey, you know, Fuchsia is good or bad or ready or anything like that. We're just going to share this experience and see what is Fuchsia like when you experience it. So step two, get the tools. And that's what's cool about Fuchsia.dev is that they've kind of created one place to go that's tied things together. I've looked at a lot of different videos uh, as I've prepared for this presentation. And you can see in the videos when they type the command, sometimes it's a Python script, sometimes it's different things. Over short periods of time, the tooling and the processes can change. So because Fuchsia is whatever Fuchsia is, expect that to be different. If you're watching this on a video or if you're thinking about this on your way home tonight, it might be different by then. So whatever I'm showing you, whatever I'm saying, is just my experience right now. That could be vastly different from something that someone did last week, and again, vastly different from what someone might do next week. So it starts and ends at fuchsia.dev. Let's go there. So as promised, no marketing. They're not trying to convince us to use this. They're being generous. They're opening the door to their bathroom and trusting us with the medicine cabinet. and. Just letting us kind of walk in there and say like, oh, this is how you live, that's cool. I really respect that, and I think it's very cool to be able to take a peek at this process. When you click on Start here, you're navigating down into some very good documentation. And I say very good, those words are tricky. I don't want to say very current or very accurate, but very good. What do I mean by good? Good means to me that Someone thought it through. They've got a structure, and sure, maybe some of the things are out of date or confusing or could use a little bit of help or change. It's not a product that they've shipped. So you're not looking at an alpha release here or a beta release and like, please give us your feedback. It's like, here, you want to you wanna build this? You want to play? You want to go through that? You're welcome to try. And here's the beginnings of a very good uh, comprehensive resource to learn about Fuchsia. Now, there's a couple of things that you could do first, and I clicked on getting started. And here we see one of the many things that keeps our community really kind of wanting to know more. These mysterious phrases or mysterious descriptions. Uh, what is pink plus purple? Well, that's Fuchsia, a new operating system. <laughs> All right, so actually, as I was researching this, I have discovered that there's a pretty good reason for this. Sorry. These, uh, these colors were code names for Apple products, one for a mobile and one for a desktop. Are they related in any way to the claim that pink plus purple equals fuchsia? I have no idea. Not a Googler. I'm a developer, and we're experiencing this together. As we go into the things that we need to do, we see, okay, we need to get the source. Now here's the path that I took, and I'm gonna take you on the same path. This computer right here is kind of my daily driver, and it's booted into Ubuntu 1904. Something's terribly wrong with that statement. <laughs> this probably should not be a 1904 edition of Ubuntu. This should probably be an LTS, and I'll explain a little bit why uh, soon, but, Let's just say I might have caused some problems for myself by living on the bleeding edge of my development tools as well as trying to develop for, not even the bleeding edge, it's more like someone has an idea that they're going to cut something, like pre-edge uh, process here. So what I did was to download, uh, so we're supposed to, on Debian, which, which is pretty much that, we're supposed to do a sudo app get install build essential curl git python. I already had all that stuff, but what I was really interested in is up here. Um, oh, you know what? It might have even changed since then. <laughs> ah, sorry, it's down below. Uh, get the source. So follow the instructions to get the fuchsia source and then return to this document. So the first thing you do is go somewhere else and then you come back. That's, that's okay. We'll do that. Fuchsia source. Who has heard of this tool that I'm circling with the mouse right there? Can you say it out loud if you've heard of this before? It's a test, an experiment. No wrong answer, really. 
Well, there is a wrong answer. So I would have said Jiri when I first saw that, but as I was reading through the documents, apparently it's pronounced Yiri. So you heard it here first, and hopefully you heard it the right way. I'm not sure about that. And I think that's kind of cool that they've got this new set of tools that they've built. They can give it these new names, and much of the process that I've experienced as I step into this world is, oh, there's this new tool. Oh, it's got this name. Oh, it does this new thing in a new way. Oh, that's pretty cool. Oh, I wonder if I could use that with some of my other development work. Uh, but this is probably pretty much only in the uh, Fuchsia ecosystem for now, so maybe not. What Yuri does is manage multiple Git repositories at the same time. So a lot of times I've had a project where maybe I've got five, six, 12 repositories and I go write a shell script and my shell script goes into a directory and it does a, a git fetch and it might try to do something else beyond that. But if it does, it's probably gonna cause problems and I'm gonna have to go clean up after it. Yuri is able to sort of like open up multiple processes at the same time concurrently that are getting all of these different git repos and pulling them in together and I, I didn't know life could be that way. That's really cool. Um, the fact that it's running for Fuchsia, okay, that's how I learned about it, but now that I've seen this happening, I want to kind of poke around at it and spend some more time. See, I wonder, could I, I could probably use this anywhere. Here's why I think that theory might work, because I'm running it on my Ubuntu laptop. I happen to be pointing it at Fuchsia repos, but maybe this is something that I could use. So I think that's interesting to explore a little bit more. Now here is a command that you should never, ever run from anybody ever without looking at the source of what you're about to feed directly into the heart of your machine. So when you go to look at this source, let's do that. I'm just gonna copy and paste. This is what you should be doing every time someone says that you're supposed to run a shell script from the web because at the end you can't see it, but um, it pipes into bash, which means whatever happens, happens. I'm gonna open that up and here is what you get. Aha, I get a bootstrap doc text. Okay, that's cool. I'll drop that on my desktop and I'll save it. And let's open up that file. See what we have inside, uh-oh. I can't read that, because I don't inherently understand base64. So what you have to do is decode that, and this tiny bit of text expands to really quite an impressive shell script that is going to do all the things to basically set up your local machine to be a development environment. Now, as I thought about how I could do this, I, I reached for an instinctive tool that I like. It's called Docker. Have you heard of Docker? Have you used Docker? feels like Docker should probably work everywhere for everything. And uh, I was starting to think about, well, what do I want to actually you know, do for this presentation? I thought, you know what, since we have to do a lot of things manually, maybe I'll bundle up all these tools and I'll put them in a, a Docker container, you know? And then I'll make an image and I'll put that on Docker Hub. And then I'll stand up here and I'll be like, oh, everyone, I'm so happy to announce you don't have to do this yourself. You can just go to Docker Hub and you can just run it. And you, you just like magically have Fuchsia on all your machines. You get Fuchsia and you get Fuchsia. <laughs> I, I still kind of want to play a little bit more in that space, but let me just tell you, after uploading 12 gigabytes and realizing that there must, at some point, there must be a limit to the size of an image that Docker Hub can hold, right? 12 gig, that's getting excessive. Uh, I started to think, you know what, this isn't even really worth the time that you would spend downloading because it took maybe about 45 minutes for that shell script that we just looked at to run and to basically get all the things I needed. So should we dockerize this? No. Did we dockerize this? Yes. <laughs> uh, so if we go to hub.docker.com. The reason that I like docker images Part of it's that I can just type a single command and something runs, but my favorite part is that I can look at someone else's thinking process, because that's what all of us do. Programming, developing, we are ordering our thoughts. And when we do it connecting with other people, 
we're ordering our thoughts together. And when you force yourself to order your thoughts in a way that a machine understands, say using a programming language or a, a shell script or a Docker file, there's something so magical that happens that no amount of documentation or demoing could ever match, in my opinion. And that is, you can see what you're actually supposed to do. <laughs> so I'm going to see if I can uh, pull up F U C. If that's the root word. It's very dangerous to type on a tiny screen. S I A P S H A. And we want to find the developers organization. I'm going to just pop into someone else's space here. Hi, AL Rounds. Fuchsia End. This looks cool. I will come back and check this out. But right now, I want to change the path. Dev Relapers. Which, by the way, a lot of people ask me, like, were you drunk when you named your company? It's a fair question. <laughs> no, I was not. Uh, that's the word DevRel, like developer relations, inserted into the word developer. <laughs> um, there we go. Unofficial. This is the most important thing on the page. The second most important thing. This is bad. 12 gigabytes of, okay. I mean, if it were like a four hour compilation time, sure, you might start to weigh the trade-offs. Just download it. Look at the Docker file. No Docker file available. Ah, go to the GitHub repo and look at the Docker file. And this is wired up through the automations for uh, Docker Cloud to build this. It runs out of memory and it complains and it says you gave me too much and I won't do this. So these are the steps basically that you will want to go through. And I see that I actually have a couple more steps on this machine. I'll push, even though this is bad, don't do this. I'll push this because it's interesting to see the Docker file. It's a very concise way to see these are the steps that I went through. So if you're looking for the steps that I went through, these are those. I did not use Docker. I sent something to Docker Hub, but I didn't use Docker in this process, just to make that super clear. So these steps were, were pretty interesting. Then once you're over here, you've got your downloaded system uh, ready to go. That was something I posted as a video. Uh, I don't know if you've seen As As Cinema, As -E Nima. Yeah, it's ASCII, the word ASCII, but like the word cinema. And what you do is you start recording your screen, but it's actually recording the sequence of characters that came out on your screen. And then you can actually select, like in a video, you can't select text. The uploaded video, you can actually pause, select what's on the screen, copy and paste, and I love that. That's the best thing. So I recorded a video of building that first step where you see that you're you know, running the base64 encoded shell script. To be honest, I didn't actually read what it does before I ran it. I just said, hey, it's Google. I trusted it and I ran it. It did whatever it did. And I had this local system in Ubuntu 19.04 it occasionally will send me a message that there's been a system error. Would you like to report it? This has been going on for months, unrelated. And uh, I didn't see any more or any less of those after that process. But then I ran this Geary thing, pulled down uh, all of the, did I? Is that what I did next? We can check. Yep, I curled it. And then I set my environment to add the path to the Geary tools. There's a dot directory, uh, it'll add a Fuchsia directory. So if you're root, it's the root of your drive. If you're a user, it's your username's path slash Fuchsia. You get all the things in there, starting with 12 gigs. Then you start to uh, build things. And my total size of that Fuchsia folder right now is 110.1 gigabytes of whatever. Not quite sure how much of that is necessary for what I'm interested in, but I do know that for me to get from point A to point C, I had to go through that path. So if you need a little bit of room, you probably want to have a pretty good processor with several cores and a decent amount of RAM in an air-conditioned room, <laughs> left alone, locked, away from children. I know for sure. My son was very interested in the black and green screen. He loves to sit down actually with this laptop because uh, we have a home office. He'll come in and he'll say, 
daddy will work, 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 and Soli will play, play, play. And when he gets his hands on this laptop, I put him in full screen Emacs and sit him on the couch and he can type whatever he wants. And he's so proud that Soli can play, 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 or work, 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 just like daddy. So it was terrifying for him to see all of this green stuff happening, black and green, black and green, and he couldn't get involved. And I was like, no, no, we, we gotta let this run. You're going to spend a lot of time building. That's, that's the main takeaway. Then you're going to have to figure out how to actually get what you've built to be Fusion. I mean, you've built and built and built code, but what's going to run it? Anytime you're issuing a command, if nobody's listening, nothing will happen. Anytime I tell my computer, boot, there has to be one domino or several that get knocked down and this whole process gets kicked off. So I thought to myself, well, if this is ready for development, I would run this in an emulator. Like, you know, the Android emulator or the iOS emulator, I would have a Fuchsia emulator. And that must certainly be what they've prepared for us because they've released this website. So, And there's a whole train of thought that was like, oh, because there's a website, uh, ergo, there must be a reason. No, no. I don't know if there's a reason. I don't care if there's a reason. They've been very generous to share with us. And in the process of uh, building things, I'm not privy to their, their build process, their tools, or, or whatever. But I figured um, if it's ready for me as a developer to play, I'll, I'll see something there. So what I was reading in the documentation, you remember they told us to go somewhere and then come back. So we went there, we built things, and added it to our path. And then we'll go back. And here we see one more of these new tools. So we've seen Yuri, now we see FX. And I saw, okay, they're telling me next I need to set um, the FX to core.x64 uh, with bundles, kitchen sink. And I thought, you know what, it's so weird that they're putting a comment at the end of, you see the comment at the end of that line? Will this come over here? Slash, slash, bundles, kitchen sink. You know what? It's like, hey, forget about bundles, kitchen sink. Not the case. A recurring theme in Fuchsia that I've seen is this slash, slash, and you're actually specifying an official Fuchsia, I'm going to use the word path, because I don't remember the official term. You're going to see that several times as we look around. So that's actually correct. However, it is still my Ubuntu laptop that is building this. So later we're going to see a place where my command line doesn't like what happens, and I just have to wrap that command in quotes. Specifically, I have the uh, hash symbol in part of the command, and my CLI is like, oh, OK, so you're all done with that. But if I wrap it in quotes, it's fine. It just says, oh, OK, I'll take this as one entity. So these are different ways that you can set your FX. Now, I don't know if this is a thing. I'm making this up off the top of my head, okay? But there's this term network effects. And everything that FX is doing is like happening over the network. So it's kind of making me wonder, like, hmm, network effects? I don't know. And if it's not a thing, it should maybe be a thing, because that's pretty cool. Um, what you're going to do here is basically run a tool that is going to manage tools that are made of build tools so the build tool, Ninja, can build. And then after you've built, 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 all of these things are beautifully wired up and surprisingly efficient. And it does take a long time to compile. I don't have the fastest machine, and I did several things wrong, so I had to go back and redo it. So it felt a lot longer than it was. I probably only spent maybe, 48 hours of actual, like, Arr, what the heck is going on? But the compilation time uh, for each of these builds gets better and better because there's this caching process. So if it doesn't have to rebuild something, it's pretty good at, at not making you wait through all of that. So when you see this command, fx set workstation, and we're definitely coming back to that one. Remember that when you switch between these different ones, you might not have to wait as long as you did the first time. And I noted that on my system, at least, I did not have to use the dash dash ccache to 
have it do this caching process. Um, I don't know if that would be your experience as well. So then it's like, okay, boot fuchsia. 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 I don't like that. Fuchsia. We'll leave that alone. They know what they're doing. I don't. So I'm just typing FX run. Great. Now I saw it wanted to run Kimu, and I thought to myself, well, I've got VirtualBox on this system. I've been meaning to get a couple others. Uh, DigitalOcean uses uh, some Kimu stuff to upload images, and I thought, yeah, it's kind of a good tool to have. Um, I can play with it in other contexts. So on Ubuntu 19.04, I started to install Kimu. Big mistake. In fact, I actually had a segmentation fault, and I panicked. I panicked. This, this machine had the seg fault. I was the one who panicked. Because I'm in this process of trying to do something which feels very delicately balanced to me. And in that process, I, I did something that was clearly not right. Because you're actually getting the Kimu stuff pre-built in your process of downloading. That's part of that 110.1 gigabytes of all the things. And I thought, well, I'm just going to let that break and sit off to the side and do what it does. I'm going to just trust that when I type this command, whatever they provide it will just do its thing. And here's why I think that. Because us developers, we're probably all in the process of a project right now, right? I'm doing a, like an educational thing where I'm writing a course to teach Angular 8. And it's a, a whole lot of fun. But if you ever just walked into my process and looked at it, you wouldn't see stuff that's just like pointless, right? I mean, I'm working. It has to work for me. So when we're looking at these things, I figure, eh, maybe there's magic sauce. You have to be a Googler to get this or that. And maybe there's not. Maybe they've just given us everything. So I tried FX Run. And I saw, aha, flags. I love flags. Let's go ahead and add all the flags. And we'll see what happens. I see that I need to add Attack G to get graphics. I need to maybe set memory if it's an issue. I left that alone. I would just, please, I would like networking. OK, so uppercase N. There's also a lowercase one. Not sure what the difference is, but it's documented, so you can find it here. And KVM acceleration. Sure, I'll take acceleration. And I figured, OK, what, what's the worst thing that could happen? Here's the worst thing that could happen, at least in that moment. You can get stuck inside of your own command line. It's been years since that's happened to me. Like, you remember the first time you opened VI and you're like, I'm never gonna leave. <laughs> I'm just, this is my life now. So I got stuck inside of Kimo. This is why we have several devices up here, by the way. This machine was where I was surfing the internet, making sure I could actually like navigate around. This machine was the host, and it was building, 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 and then I was not yet in touch with this machine over here. So I was thinking, okay, build, 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 let's run it in a virtual environment. And I did. I got the Zircon kernel to run. Now the Zircon kernel used to be called Magenta, and so kind of the whole color scheme going on there. Uh, but now it's called Zircon, and that sounds very cool, like some kind of alien robot came to bless our planet with a new operating system. Um, the way that the Zircon kernel works is this. People much smarter than me build it, and I just trust that it, it works. Then I saw that the graphics weren't just automatically going to come up. I thought, okay, well, I should read. I should read more. I read more, and I started to see, aha, graphics under Kimu are extremely limited due to a lack of Vulkan support. It's like, I'm right there. Just tell me what you need. I will give it to you. It turns out that there are certain chips that use different protocols. One of the protocols for the graphics uh, chips are uh, called Vulkan, which is also very cool. We've got Zircon and Vulkan, and we're doing network effects and building. And it was a really enjoyable process. And as you can see, I mean, these are step, step, step. Commentary, letting you know, this might not work. This will be tricky. I was like, OK. So to enable graphics under Kimu, uh, add the G flag to FX run, sure. And then, all right, we've got this, uh, this whole process laid out. We can try different things. Um, boot, fuchsia, fuchsia with networking. Uh, OK, uh, tried all this. And I get to the point where I'm ready to type a command, and I type fortune, and it couldn't be found. So clearly, something was wrong. I had a working environment. In fact, I couldn't have anything but a working environment until I did, I think it was Control-A, 
escape, face east, and like return, return, and type <laughs> something. It's in the documentation as well. There are some tips, uh, best practices. There's actually quite a lot that helped me through this process. And so, I read somewhere, which may have changed since, that you're just not going to get graphics. Ah, here it is. Kimu does not support Vulkan and therefore cannot run our graphics stack. End of story. Time to, to call Martin and be like, hey man, we tried. I'm sorry. It's done. We're, we're through here because uh, I just, I can't get graphics running. And you know what Flutter loves to run with is graphics. So I was just kind of, we started emailing and I was, you know, preparing my apology and, and uh, thinking about stepping down from my position as the guy that was trying to get this to work. And then uh, Martin reached out and he was like, you know, uh, I know some people, should I say who? Yeah, so Google is like, hey, you want to borrow a pixel book? Heck, yes I do. This is when it got super interesting for me. This is the pixel book. It was brand new in the shrink wrapping, which is over there. It feels nice and hefty, and it's one of three officially supported devices listed in the documentation on Fuchsia.dev. Now, when I say officially supported, I don't mean that. I mean three of the named devices that clearly are on the radar of the people that are building this. I'm not trying to claim that anybody's supporting anything, but the happy ending to this tale will show that even though there may not be an official support process in place, there are some people that are just super willing to help and reach out with answers and provide that little extra nudge that I needed to actually get this thing to run. So I want to show you the process that I used that was different than building for an emulator on here and to actually pave and put this operating system over here. But first, I want to check in on time. I can tell by my sore throat that I've probably been talking a lot for a long time. Let's just, uh, yeah, my son should be going to bed pretty soon so we can really get wild here. All right, so what I did that I learned I did not need to do so much, really, was, oops. I just decided I'll put in my credentials, log in to my Google account, because I read that one of the first steps that I needed to work with was to like update the machine and see if there was anything that uh, needed to be updated. So I thought the best way to do that, if like my cell phone needs to update, I know I need to log into the Google Play Store so that it can then authorize just going to close that for a minute. That's intended behavior, those beeps. So uh, I figured, you know, logging in, probably a good idea. It looks like you don't have to do that. So if you buy a Pixel Book and you're just trying Fuchsia and that's what you're doing, maybe you don't have to log in. Because I did, when I give this back tonight, I need to spend like five, ten minutes and like wipe my stuff. I can do it remotely, but uh, there is a reset process, so we'll see. In the meantime, though, I updated to the latest whatever it downloaded. I assume the reason for that, probably something firmware related, you would think, right? Because why would I need current Chrome software on a system where I'm replacing the entire operating system? That's my best theory. So let's find where they're talking about installing on that specific device. I'm gonna back up, start here, run the examples. I'm not sure. We'll come across that in due course. Um, I know, I've got it in a tab over here. So while I'm doing something else, I'll, I'll find that and I'll pull that up. So here's the process. When I did the FX run, it tried to actually spin up an uh, environment and all the various dominoes that, that fall in that process. When I want to move that over here, I figured, because I used to have to actually build things uh, back in the late 90s. Have you ever built an operating system or flashed a, a ROM or anything like that? The grueling process. So um, I started out on the web in FreeBSD and everything that I made, in FreeBSD, everything. My shell was compiled. <laughs> 
everything that I have on that machine. You just wait until it builds. And now there's like great package systems, and you can just download rebuilt binaries, and that's pretty much okay. Uh, but back then, build, build, build. Um, especially getting Linux to run on a couple of computers I had that I wanted to get like a, a replacement desktop. I didn't want to use Windows, I wanted to use Linux. This was back in Red Hat 6. That's really when I got deep, deep into the command line because I had to, because I was stuck there. I, I couldn't get into the graphics thing, I couldn't get the drivers. I was shuttling disks between machines and I figured this must be the same process, right? I need to download Fuchsia move it over here and then like flash Fuchsia or something Fuchsia to that machine. Not the case. It's a super interesting process. Here's a challenge. I have two USB-C ports. Now, without running to the store to replace all my little gadgets, what I had handy was this old SanDisk 32 gigabyte stick and it's USB-A. So um, I had this Anchor USB-C, no, hang on, it's actually USB-3. So this Anchor device, which has a network jack and three USB ports. And then I have this adapter that came with my Samsung Galaxy S9 Plus. This adapter goes from big USB to USB-C. And these are the tools that I had around my house to work with. So here's what I needed to accomplish. The first thing that was required, the blood of a virgin from the full moon. No, it was a di different process, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the first thing it required was that you do a sequence of steps to get this device into developer mode. The keyboard shortcut on this, which runs Chrome OS, uh, so it's got the fancy funky keys, new to me. Uh, the, the way that you do that is outlined in the Fuchsia docs, and I wish that I had found that link, because I could have been doing that while I was talking. Because I can multitask. Paving. Okay, workflows. So, in development, we can go to workflows, build and pave quick start. Perfect. So, you remember I did FX run before trying to get my Kimu environment going? Okay. Um, here's an FX build, so that's super important because before you run or pave, you've got to build. You've got all this source code you've downloaded, you've got to compile it into its final form, and then you're going to do FX pave. And I thought, okay, pave, pave, that sounds cool. I'm, I'm going to pave my, pave my drive and stick it in through the adapter and it's going to like upload. And I really didn't gather this process. Maybe this is how people build operating systems these days, and it's just been like 1998 since I last did it, so things have changed. I don't know, you tell me, maybe, uh, maybe you've experienced that before, but what I didn't know going into this and do now is that what I'm actually doing is turning this box into a server that has a port open, and I'm turning this box into a client that's listening for this like multitask broadcast, like like those trees that release their pollen into the wind and it spreads far and wide and, and fertilizes new trees. This machine is just spitting out on whatever network it's on, like, be fuchsia, be fuchsia. <laughs> and this machine, when it's in developer mode and it boots from the USB, which is super tiny, it's like, I will, <laughs> okay. And that's what happened. So the problem that I ran into, though, is that it kept getting a little bit into the process and then dying, and then a little bit further and then dying. What was different about each attempt? Well, it was basically this. Yearly update to get whatever the latest code was, probably an unnecessary step because I did all of this over like a four day period. So I doubt that very much had actually changed during those four days but I would just do it out of like this ritual of proper order of things. So Yuri update, make sure I've got the latest thing, and then make sure that I've set FX to the correct target that I want to build for. The first one, remember, was a virtual environment. I had to change that so that I was targeting a uh, pixel book. 
And then I was reading that I needed to FX set that pixel book to have the core, which sounds super official, right? Core, okay, that's what I need to get started here. And this is where it tripped me out because uh, as of 6 a.m. this morning, I finally got Fuchsia installed on here, but I didn't have any graphics. So you were about to be able to see a command line with like three super cool command line tabs on top, and you can like alt tab between them, and you can type commands and type more commands, and that's it. Nothing Flutter related at all. However, I reached out on IRC. Who here has used IRC, Freenode or anything like that? It's a great place to chat. It's basically what the people that made Slack were starting from. They added value and features on top of that, but you can come to the old paths and there are many deep waters. So I went on there and I said, just last ditch attempt, like, hey, is it correct to uh, assume that this major change in the source code, because the source is all open source, and you can rewind in history, and there was this article about how at one point the entire Flutter-based UI system of Fuchsia called Armadillo had actually been just deleted. It had a merge message that said Armadillo has tainted, and that was it. It's just gone. So I figured, well, okay, maybe they've taken this into their operating theater and they're gonna do stuff to it and then bring it back out and put it back out in front of us. I'm super confused about this because I was reading so clearly that they just deleted all that and I read this article that was like, oh, we're not allowed to see what's on the inside of Google anymore and like, what are they thinking? Two things that I can say right now without further investigation, no, three things. Yes. One of them is the people at Google, while they're not necessarily trying to trip over themselves to make videos and announcements and show us the way, they're very helpful people. They're people. They're developers. They care about other developers. You're struggling, even though it's not their job to go out and promo this yet, they're going to reach out and, and I see them in Reddit, I see them on Twitter, I see them active in the community, and that's super cool. Uh, the other thing I can say is that I learned one of the barriers that I had, I needed to authenticate my installation as I was pulling all these repos. I needed to open, like, okay, on the command line I typed something, I forget what, like GCP or RCA or something like that. And then authenticate, and you know, it like spits out this thing, and it's like, visit this URL. You go to the URL and it says, log into your Google account, it gives you a token, you go back to the command line, you paste the token, and then, you can pull all of these additional repos, which is super, super cool. Once I could pull all the additional repos, I started to get a little bit further and a little bit further, and then I got to the point where I just saw this and my heart fell. I was like, okay, the Armadillo is gone forever and nothing matters anymore. Well, I got this response at, what was it, about noon, Martin? And he's like, hey, try this command. If you do this, you will get graphics. I didn't know if those graphics would be... Okay, so this is a shout out to James Tucker, who I think is in California. He is a Googler working on Fuchsia. He goes by at Raggi, R-A-G-G-I. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You're the reason that this machine right here is actually running Flutter with graphics on Fuchsia today. When he gave me that one command, FX, and then set, and then workstation, not core, workstation. And then whatever the rest of that command is, like dash pixel book, dash 64, or whatever. You specify that specific target, and, and up we go. So this machine has booted, and here's why. Because I put it into developer mode, I started a server over here, I booted to this USB stick, which was super tiny, but because it didn't fit, I had to use an adapter, so that that could go in there. And then, I knew that it was supposed to get something from across the network. I figured, you know what, if I just authenticated on that Wi-Fi connection back when I was in Chrome, and then I rebooted, maybe it's cache, or maybe 
maybe when I was painting this, you know, stick, if that's what I was doing, that like it dropped in my Wi-Fi credentials, should be super creepy. And then I remembered, you know what? I've done this before, actually. Um, to make a network connection, <laughs> you have to have a network interface. And unless I have some way of accessing the Wi-Fi, then it's going to be something else. Plain and simple. So I thought to myself, I'm, I'm bringing a flawed expectation here. I'm expecting this to load over Wi-Fi. Not going to happen. That's when I got this device that's got the Cat 45 in the middle. And I plugged it in through the adapter. And then I put this stick in the top because it's also a hub. And once I did that, I had a hard line connection to the same network that I was on. But it was my guest network at my home. So I keep all my traffic segregated. I don't want any weird packets floating around in my child place. I want this to be on a private network, the guest network. Unfortunately, the guest network blocks traffic between clients. So I thought about it. Logically speaking, OK, I opened my phone, and I used an app to scan my network and see what devices are on here. Uh, the app is called Thing. I absolutely love it. It showed me one device, mine, the cell phone. And I thought, ah, this is a problem with the guest network. So the guests can't like mess with each other. So I was like, fine. I put it onto my main network. And then it was able to see across this one wired, this one wireless. And I fired up Wireshark on this machine to make sure I was seeing like anything. And I kept trying to get this to actually pay. And it just it wouldn't pay. It wouldn't pay, it wouldn't pay. And then once I finally got it to pay the little, I was just stuck in the same exact thing that I had over here. No graphics. And I was convinced that, OK, this must be you know, this must be that they just held it off to the side and then figured out, oh, I can authenticate. So that the moral of the story is when the going gets tough, take a nap and then come back, try again, and then do that again. Because a lot of these steps are just like Richard was saying earlier, you know, if you break it, you sometimes you just have to set it off to the side and just give it a fresh run. Because some of these processes that, that touch low level things when they go bad, is it worth your time to really understand why? Maybe not. So let's look at this, and I'm going to do something fancy. Martin, would you see about uh, helping to? OK, Clay. Um, so what I want to do is open photo booth. You want to set that there, right here? And then if you just carry it over. Yeah, if you want to hold this. <laughs> make it full screen. OK. Yeah. Yeah. I thought I was going to hold it last on the, on the mic holder, though. We're about to trade. All right, so Clay is going to hold the pixel book running Fuchsia, and I'm going to drive from a weird angle. The reason for this, you may ask, why we didn't does bring... Does this hold? Oh, maybe it does. Yeah. Whoa! <laughs> You're all witnesses. He broke it, not me. <laughs> He bent the thing backwards. All right. That's really cool. And it's flipped. And it flipped. Nice. So we did try. We tried plugging in an adapter, and we didn't get it working. But that could just as well be me not having loaded up the right things, enough things. You remember how I kept stepping a little bit forward, forward, forward? This is how far we got. It doesn't look like the old Armadillo interface. Maybe it is. Maybe it's back. Maybe it's this new thing called Ermin. I don't know. Here's what we have. You push the plus sign, and you get these login things. The only one, according to docs that I read, is guest. And when you press guest, you log in to Fisher. So this is the UI where I can use the ask for anything box, and I think I need to type, can I type from the back? <laughs> that would be so weird if I can't. We'll try that. While you're looking here, I'm going to type F. Uh, where's it? L, anything? You? T? No. no. OK. Cool, so it properly disables the keyboard when flipped. <laughs> OK, let's try it. Where's your print? Aha. So, 
now what we're going to do is Alt Escape D M Shut Down. Thank you all and good night. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll try this again. Power up. And it's going to come up and complain that it's not being asked to securely verify the OS. I'm going to say Control D. I'm a developer. You're fine. <laughs> it's going to give us the magical rainbow pattern at the top that says it's working really hard on being Fusion in the graphics card. Yes. Now, up here, we're going to get that. Ask for anything bar, F, L, U, T, T, E, R. And what I want is gallery, open, flutter, gallery. Now, this will take a moment, because I'm in uh, developer mode, I'm in like, debug mode, everything's super slow. But here you see, I did not build this. The Googlers built this, and they included it in the stuff that you get for free when you download all this stuff and build all this stuff and run all this stuff. And here we see we've actually got a Flutter gallery. And we can try things like, here's the material. And I can look at the bottom navigation. And if I press that heart, it actually changes the text. And you see the colors change. Now, I told you my son loves laptops. And so this is a borrowed machine. I did not let him just run wild with it. But he did an experiment. He helped me. He pressed F. And we saw, oh, nothing happened. So we've done a complete test, touch screen and keyboard together. Uh, this will let you navigate through to anything. And uh, Clay, if you want to just go wild and click on whatever comes to mind. Can you hold it while you just go to maybe uh, a shrine or something, some more complicated thing? Uh, OK, so let's see. It's from the home screen. From the home screen? There's uh, studies. Studies. Uh, OK, yeah. Uh, yeah, I got an idea to scroll around. Just up. I see flash, flash, flash. There's navigation menu. I see debug, debug. <laughs> Dark theme. There you go, try that. OK, maybe not. Uh, so. That's the best spot. This is, this is the experience. Is it good? <laughs> is it bad? It's, it's not good or bad. It's now. It was different a few days ago. It'll be different a few days from now. And I think it's a privilege to be given these toys to play with so early in the process. OK, so uh, I want to save a little time for questions. And I could have really gone into more details on how I built it. If that's interesting to you, please reach out to me. I love to talk too much. You've learned part of that tonight. <laughs> Wait till I get started. So uh, thank you so much, Clay. Yes, nice job. <laughs> All right, uh, any questions will be answered by I don't know, but Feel free if you've got them. <laughs> nope. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Have a great night.